Can you guys tell what we're starting our new series about? Fake news. Fake news. How many of you guys have heard that term before? Anybody heard that term, fake news? What's it mean? Ty? Mm -hmm. Very good definition. News that you think is real, but it's really not. And so I know uh, kind of in our world, we have a number of people that are very concerned with fake news. Our president's concerned with fake news. Some people that are supposed to be news broadcasters are being called fake news. They're concerned about it. Um, but I think they're concerned about the wrong kind of fake news. So over the next several weeks, what I want us to look at is some um, fake news about Jesus. What do you think that means? Stuff that isn't real that people think is real. Yes. Portia, what were you going to say with the same thing? All right. So stuff that isn't real that people think is real. Um, have you ever had a wrong thought about God? Anybody? Had some wrong thoughts about God, right? So some people think about God and they imagine like, you know, a white-haired grandpa with a really long beard and a flowing white robe and he's sitting in heaven, but he might have some angry looks in his eye, right? Like they have this weird kind of Zeus-centric uh, idea of God. Some other people might think, man, uh, if they said, who is God? He's the man upstairs. He, he loves you and he just wants you to be good, right? Is that... A wrong idea about God? Yeah, that is a wrong idea about God. Both of those are wrong ideas about God. Other people think about Jesus, and they imagine the guy on the crucifix. So he's like some scary-looking, skinny dude that's dying in, in his underwear. Like, that's their idea of who God is. Like, some of the pictures of crucifixes I've seen, especially in Central and South America, it's like his ribs are showing, and he's very like, thin in the face, and... And, like, those are some scary, weird thoughts about, about who God is. And so probably every one of us has had, at one time or another, a wrong thought about God. And I wanted you guys to look at this quote. An author whose name is initials, so he must be pretty cool. My initials are TR. His initials are A-W. Uh, not A and W, not the root beer. But his name is A.W. Tozer. And look at what A.W. Tozer said. What comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. So A.W. Tozer believes that it's very important for you and for me to have right thoughts about God because the thoughts that we have about God are the most important thing about us because our thoughts about God will affect our whole life. Your thoughts about God will reveal who you are and they'll determine how you live. And so that's really why we're doing this series because I don't want us to have the wrong thoughts about God. I want us to have the right thoughts about God. I want us to have the right thoughts about Jesus. And I want us to be able to spot the fake news that someone else might be believing. Right? Okay, so today's fake news is this. Jesus only loves perfect people. Do you guys think people probably really believe that? Yeah, that's probably a very valid idea that people get because maybe they're not, their life isn't so great and they look at maybe some church people they know and they seem like they have it all together. And so they come up with this fake news idea that Jesus only loves perfect people. They think they've messed up too much for Jesus to love them, but that's not true. In fact, that would be called what? Fake news, right? That's fake news because Jesus loves everybody and he loves each and every one of us so much that he sees us in our messed up state. He sees us in our sin. He sees us when we've done everything wrong and he loves us and he doesn't want to leave us in that position any longer. Jesus could find you at the lowest place in your life and he'll love you right where you're at, but he's not going to, he loves you too much to leave you in the lowest place in your life. Does that make sense? So tonight I want um, to look at some stories of some very much less than perfect people that Jesus loved to show you that that idea is fake news, okay? We're going to go real quick through these. And so what I've done in your notes is I've left you the entire story. Um, there used to be, uh, what was it? And now the rest of the story. What was that guy's name? Uh, how come I cannot remember the news guy? Uh, it'll come to me later. 
Anyway, he's, he's long since dead, but he would tell you a little story, and then he would say, and now the rest of the story. And he would go on the radio and tell you these long, really cool stories. Um, the only newsman's name to come to mind is Walter Cronkite, and that was not Walter Cronkite that said the rest of the story. So anyway, the first one you see here is the Samaritan woman. So I've put the story of the Samaritan woman, which is John chapter 4, verses 1 through 6, uh, 26, and you can read that. You got it, Erica? Paul Harvey, yes, Paul Harvey. I used to love listening to Paul Harvey stories. Um, so um, you can read the rest of the story like Paul Harvey would say this week on all these stories, okay? So I'm not gonna read all the story to you. I'm just gonna give you a, a synopsis, a quick brief overview of the story. But John 4 tells us the story of Jesus' encounter with a woman that we're only told is a Samaritan woman, meaning she's from the country of Samaria, so uh, we are from the country of America, and so we are what? Americans. Americans. She is from a country called Samaria, and so she is a what? Samaritan, right? And so the problem is here uh, that the Samaritans were looked down on by Jewish people because at one point in their history, they were all from the same family. They were all Jewish people, and the Samaritans, uh, they strayed away from God and they got sent into exile, and some people from other countries came, and they started to uh, take on the characteristics of people from other countries. They mixed their families with these people, and they strayed away from God's direct command to not do that. And so the Jewish people looked at them as they were not purely Jewish anymore, because it wasn't just that their beliefs or that, that they had intermarried with these people, but their entire lifestyle had changed because of it. So they were looked down on because of that. In Jesus' time, it wasn't customary, it wasn't right for a man to speak to a, another woman alone in, in public that was not his family member. So the proper way would have been for Jesus and the husband to have a conversation, and then the husband could bring the wife into the conversation, but it was just Jesus and this woman. Um, and it was also a problem because this woman was actually active in a sexual sin. And so all these things were going against her that, that Jesus shouldn't have had this conversation, but Jesus did have the conversation. And the Bible tells us that it wasn't just that Jesus talked to this woman. He instigated the conversation. He went to the well in the middle of the day, and he asked her for a drink. And she began this conversation with Jesus. So this, there was, it's called taboo. It was, it was wrong on multiple levels. But Jesus didn't really care about the conversation. In fact, Jesus went out of his way. The Bible tells us that he had to go through Samaria. There were other ways for them to get along their destination that Jesus could have taken. The disciples could have gone a different route. But uh, John tells us that it was almost a compulsion for Jesus to go through Samaria. And the reason was because there was this messed up, imperfect woman who needed truth in her life. And Jesus loved her enough to go and tell her about the truth. And because he had that conversation, she, uh, the disciples had gone off to get some food and Jesus is there at the well and, and they come back and this woman goes running off into town and the disciples are really confused. Why is Jesus talking to this lady? She goes into town and she comes and says, hey, everybody come and meet a man who's told me everything I've ever done. You're not gonna believe it. I think he's the Messiah. And so the entire village leaves and they come and many of them come to faith in Christ because Jesus had this conversation with this imperfect woman. Does that show his love for her and show his love for the entire Samaritan village? Yeah, yeah. Jesus loves imperfect people and he loves them enough to help them move out of their imperfect past. And in fact, Paul said in 2 Corinthians 5, 17 that we are no longer the old self. We're no longer uh, that old thing. We are a new creation in Christ. And that's how much Jesus loves us. He, he loves us in our imperfection, but he helps us become something new in him. The second story I want you to point out is that Jesus loved this guy known as the tax collector. The tax collector. And this story is in Luke chapter 19. And in Jesus' time, tax collectors were known for being uh, dishonest. They were liars. They were known for being thieves because they collected extra tax so that they could become wealthy off the people. And they were looked at as traitors because at this time, Israel was under the control of the Roman government, and these people were collecting taxes for Rome. 
it would be like if our country got invaded by another country and people, like some of us, went to each other's houses to get money to help this invading country. Would you think that person's a traitor? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, so that's how people viewed tax collectors. And Jesus meets this tax collector whose name is Zacchaeus. And um, Zacchaeus would have been pushed to the outside. He would have been ostracized. He would have been cast out because he was a liar, he was a thief, and he was a traitor. And so nobody wanted to be around Zacchaeus. But in Luke chapter 19, look at what Jesus says to Zacchaeus. He says, I must stay at your house today. So just in the same way that Jesus felt, he, he felt a compulsion to go through Samaria to meet the woman at the well, Jesus is walking along and he sees this dude named Zacchaeus who's a liar, he's a thief, and he's a traitor. And guess what? He says, I must stay at your house today. Now, that might not sound like a big deal, but in Jesus' time, if you chose to share a meal with somebody, it was a level of acceptance of that person right? It's not like we go to a restaurant and we just might happen to eat, you know, with a crazy guy at Taco Bueno that puts his hand all over your food <laughs> while you're waiting for your meal. It's in the bag. It's in the bag. You know, that's not the same thing because we go to a public restaurant and we, we have a meal together. But it was a whole different thing. It was a level of acceptance to go. And so it was saying, in, in one way, I, I kind of approve of this person if you go to eat a meal with him. Now, did Jesus leave Zacchaeus at a point where he's a thief and a liar and a traitor? No. And in fact, if you read that story, it wasn't just that I must, this level of acceptance, this level of love from Jesus caused Zacchaeus to see that he had done wrong. It caused him to realize the point of sin that he was at. And so Zacchaeus in response to Jesus' love and in response to Jesus coming to his house to have a meal, Zacchaeus says, you know what, Lord? I'm gonna give half of everything that I own to the poor, and if I've wronged anybody, I'm gonna pay them back double what I've taken. So does that show that Zacchaeus' heart had actually changed? Yeah, right? So did Jesus leave Zacchaeus at the point of being a liar, a cheater, and a traitor? No, no, he, he loved him enough to, to bring him an imperfect person and, and Zacchaeus' life was changed. And you think how many people's life would have been different if Jesus hadn't done that? All those people that Zacchaeus had stolen from, all the people that he had cheated, they would have been out everything that they had worked so hard to get. But their lives were also affected because Jesus loves imperfect people. The third story that we would see is in Matthew chapter 8. And this person is known as the leper, the leper, not the leopard, not a spotted uh, cat, feline animal, but a leper. And that means a person who has a skin disease that is generally lumped into the category of leprosy. So leprosy could be a number of different skin diseases, but for the most part, leprosy was a major problem in, in Jesus' time, in biblical times. Um, and the problem was that leprosy was deadly. It would cause your tissue um, to, to break down. You, would, you could get gangrene, which could kill you. Um, parts of your body could literally fall off from being rotten. And so it was very contagious, and it was contagious through contact. So if you touched a leper, guess what you could get? Leprosy. So these people were pushed to the very outskirts of society. They were forced to go around declaring that they were unclean so that people would stay away from them. They couldn't live in the villages because they could be contagious and they could cause leprosy to break out among other people. And so they were, were people that you just were not around. You didn't touch them. You didn't go near them. And in Matthew chapter 8, verse 3, look at how Jesus responded to this leper. He said he stretched out his hand and touched him, saying, I am willing, be clean and immediately his leprosy was cleansed. So this leper is crying out, Jesus, have mercy on me. And he says, if you're willing, you can make me whole. And Jesus' response is, hey, yeah, I am willing. Jesus wasn't frightened by the fact that this man was sick. He wasn't, he wasn't scared by the fact of what could happen to him. Jesus loved an imperfect person and wanted to bring him out of the point of his sickness, out of the point of his illness, and to change his life because Jesus loves imperfect people. Um, the fourth story that I would challenge you to look at is in Luke chapter 6. Uh, this is, I'm just called him the disabled man. 
We don't really know a lot. Um, the Bible tells us that in, in uh, Luke 6, Jesus was, he had gone to the Jewish church, which was known as the synagogue. And it was common that on the Sabbath, they would gather together in this place and they would read from the Old Testament scriptures together. And so Jesus went into the synagogue and he began to teach the people that had gathered there on this, on this day. And, and we know that there were some religious people uh, known as Pharisees and Sadducees that were in the synagogue. And they always, they wanted to challenge Jesus. They wanted to try and trap him in doing something wrong. And so in the crowd that day was a man who had a withered hand, as all the Bible tells us. He was disabled. Something was wrong that had crippled this man's hand. And so they tried to trap Jesus and they, they asked him, you know, is it, uh, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? Because the God's one of the Ten Commandments is you should honor the Sabbath day and keep it holy, right? So these different groups would set certain amount of limitations on what work could be done on the Sabbath, what constituted work. And so they, they like got really technical about these things, and they said you could only walk a certain number of miles on the Sabbath because if you walked any more than that, it would be work. So you had to keep everything within a certain distance of your house. And, and so they were trying to trap Jesus, and they asked him if it's, if it's acceptable to heal on the Sabbath. And do you think Jesus was concerned about what their idea of Sabbath rules were? What do you think Jesus was more concerned with? He was more concerned with this man who had a hand that was withered and crippled. And so Jesus... All he did was tell the man to stretch out his hand. And guess what? When he stretched out his hand, it was whole. He pulled his hand out of his robe. It went into his robe with it. He pulled it out, and it was whole. And it made a bunch of people mad. Uh, but Jesus loves us even in a point of our imperfection, and he's not willing to leave us in our mess, right? So if somebody walked up to you and said, Jesus only loves perfect people, what would you say? Fake news. That is fake news right? It is so fake news because Jesus loves imperfect people because guess who is perfect? Jesus is perfect. And when he, we come to him in faith and we say, God, I want my sins to be forgiven. I believe that Jesus is your son. I believe he died on a cross for me. And I believe he rose again and he's preparing a place for me. Then God then sees us as perfect because of Jesus' perfection. And guess what? Jesus, love out, out. Jesus loves outcasts. And he sees people that are outcasts. He sees people that are pushed aside. He sees people that are marginalized by others. And he calls them family, right? Jesus loves liars and thieves because he knows that through him, when the liars and the thieves come to Jesus, that he can make them something brand new and he can turn their life around. And the people that they've lied to and stolen from can even have their life impacted because Jesus makes all things new. Jesus loves those that no one else will get close to because he's not afraid of whatever has kept them away from people. Right? Jesus loves us enough to take us at our lowest point because he knows that in him we can become something so much better. Because God is all about loving people. And Jesus is all about taking people where they are and showing them that life can be full and real and abundant in him. And Jesus goes out of his way to love people, to show them everlasting life. And tonight, as we close, I want to encourage you to do the same thing. I want to encourage you this week to go out of your way to show people God's love. I want to encourage you that this week you would find ways to reach out into the world, the people that are pushed aside, the people that are marginalized, the people that are outcast by others. And I want you to, to ask God to help them uh, see his love. I want, I want you to find people that think that God only loves perfect people and help them see that that is fake news, that, that, that Jesus really wants to take you at your point of imperfection and make you something so much more in him. And I want to encourage you to help people to see that Jesus loves them even at the point of their deepest need because he can pull them up from that point and show them real, full, and abundant life. Right? So does Jesus only love perfect people? No. Does Jesus love all of us? Yeah. Does he want us to become something more in him?
Let's pray. Jesus, we thank you for this opportunity that we've had to look into your word. And I pray that we would know reality, Lord God, that it, tonight, if we've heard nothing else, we would know that if someone says Jesus only loves perfect people and Christians are all about just being perfect, that we would know that's fake news. Uh, because Jesus, you uh, take imperfect people and you give them a uh, new purpose, new life, new hope. Uh, God, I thank you that through Jesus, we are, imper we, are, we are perfect and we are righteous and we are holy because of Jesus' sacrifice that has paid the price for our sins. And Lord, I pray that you would help us to show uh, the people that we come into contact with this week uh, the truth of who you are and how we live, that we would point people to you. Uh, just give us that strength to do that, Lord. We love you. We thank you. And we ask these things in the power of your name.